but we'll get started here, and it's good to see you this evening. Uh, we've got quite a few passages of scripture, uh, obviously in this type of a study, entitled Saving the Local Church. That's our mini-series. It's mini-series until I decide if I need to maximize it, but <laughs> it's mini-series right now, Saving the Local Church. <coughs> And uh, this is lesson three, topical number 865. Um, and um, I entitled this lesson, Can the World Cancel Jesus Christ? We live in a day and age when, you know, certain folks and their talking heads, you need to tow the party line or tow the company line or tow the culture line, uh, get in line in other words. That's a line that you don't want to be in because it's going straight to hell. And that's the line that I'm not going to get into. Uh, I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to stay in the Word. Uh, and that's going to be my guide. I believe that's your guide for sure. And uh, I just want to start with John chapter 8 and verse 12. I made a copy of the first lesson for a few folks. And I can make a copy of the second lesson if, if anybody wants that one as well. This is, of course, again, the third lesson. Can the world cancel Christ? And I can email these to anyone uh, if they want that as well. I can email it to you. When I, we were first starting out in 2007 on the Internet, uh, we had a website. Uh, and... Um, we, um, I would send the written notes on the internet uh, every week. I did it for years and years and years. And I, I don't know, till 2015, 2014, 2015, before we went to uh, a new website that has a different platform and a little bit different option. But a lot of what I sent was uh, uh, notes and so I had a ton, a ton of notes that went uh, with book studies, uh, other types of studies, and I would just click and drag it out of the however many notes I had prepared, send it to uh, our IT guy, Kerry Krause, that lives in, um, uh, up towards Farmville. He taught, uh, both of them taught uh, school. He taught at the... Uh, uh, Fisherville Rehabilitation Center where they help train people to get back into the workforce that have had strokes and different things and uh, they can't do what they did before so he taught uh, computers and computer science up there but he would uh, put it on the internet so people would just run off copies or they would download them to their computers and they would have it so that was a real handy thing to have we don't have that anymore I used to put the pastor's letter on every month, so it was on for years. Every month on the internet, we've lost that. So it's made a little bit of a difference, so you know people can at least go back and look and do it through the YouTube channel. It, it gets out a little bit further in the world, of course. Facebook doesn't that much, but YouTube gets out in the world more. So that's good, but we want to uh, continue getting the word out and teaching the word, and uh, everybody, in their part of the, of the United States or in other parts of the world that has local churches. Um, they deal with their own struggles where they are, um, but it's all the same. Uh, the world is trying to cancel Jesus Christ. That's nothing new. They crucified him. That's the perfect example of being canceled. But he had a greater purpose than satisfying uh, the sinfulness of mankind. He was dying for the sins of mankind. Jesus Christ said in John 8 and verse 12, then spoke Jesus again to them saying, I am the light of the world. <clears throat> he that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. First John starts off pretty close with this. This then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light. 
and in him is no darkness at all, John 1 and verse 5, that God is light and in him <coughs> no scotia, no spiritual moral darkness uh, abides at all. So if we as Christians, John's a believer, say that we have fellowship with him, that is the Lord God, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, which means we're not walking in the light of the truth, then we are liars and we are and do not the truth. That is poeta, the word there means to practice. We are not practicing the truth if we are walking in darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light or is the light, and the walk there is present active, means continuous action of present time. It's a habit of life. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, keeps on cleansing us from all sins. These would be the sins of ignorance. 1 John 1, 9 are the sins of cognizance. 1 John 1, 7 is our sins of ignorance. He'll bring you that delight eventually as well. But he said, I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness. If you cancel Jesus Christ, you cancel God, and you're walking in darkness. I talk to everyone that I can about this. I'm sure you probably do as well. But we have to be aware. We have to be cognizant of that. I am the light of the world. He that follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Exitu fos tes zoes. Exitu fos tes zoes. Shall have the two, means definite article, shall have the light of the life. And the word there is, of course, eternal life. And so if you say you have eternal life, that's the light and the life that we should be walking in. Already, as I've said before, we are dead already to this world. A lot of Christians are still trying to figure out how to walk around that. You can't. You're just wasting, just like somebody that's stuck in mud. They're spinning their wheels. They're not getting anywhere. If we walk, and of course, you know, walk means to conduct our lives or conduct ourselves according to his light, which is his commandments and precepts, we are walking in fellowship with him, which means we are not... We are not agreeing with the methods and the precepts and the values of the world. We will not be conducting or agreeing with the methods and the precepts and the values of the world. We brought this out that there are lessons that we must understand in our first lesson of what we call reality checks reality checks that the son of God was crucified because the world was in disagreement with him politically, religious wise philosophically the world was in disagreement with him for who he was when we walk in agreement with him we're walking in fellowship so in order for us to walk in fellowship with the Lord all the time, we are going to be going against the tide of current cultural push. We're going to go against the tide of materialism. We're going to go against the tide of, of um, compromise. Doesn't mean we have to always be ready to ball our fist up and sock somebody or <laughs> go on put our dukes up, as they used to say. That's not the philosophy of of the life that we are to have but we're not going to be in agreement with the world and at the same time walk in the light you can't have it both ways I can't have it both ways and so with that being said this already puts the believer in conflict with the values and the sentiments of this world we are already in conflict if we walk in fellowship with the Lord and so when the world pushes against us with its values the world is not pushing against you or me. They're pushing against Jesus Christ, who you represent, who I represent. His values are not acceptable. And I have to ask people, even as we're on the uh, Facebook, that when 
your time with the world means more to you than the time with your Lord, then you're not walking in fellowship with the Lord. You're losing rewards and you're spinning your wheels. I think all of us at some time in our Christian life have spent some period of time spinning our wheels, hopefully not too much, because you can't get any traction from the divine point of view when that's happening. But our values that come from the Lord, they put us in conflict with the sinful actions and the abominations and the words and the deeds and the ways of the world. It's called the cosmic system. It is a term there, cosmic system. And it's Satan's underhanded plan of antagonism toward God. It is both covert and it is overt. It was covert for decades. But here in the last 10 years, in the last few years, it has become extremely overt. As your callousness, as the world's callousness has become hardened more and more and more by their free volition to not accept in their conscience the the accountability to God their crassness and their detachment from God and people has become more expressive and they don't have any qualms about getting in your face about being disgraceful in their actions in society in the public schools they have no qualms about it because they are reprobates and reprobates are going to do what reprobates are going to do. And so there's no use in me scratching my head because we have enough theology to know a reprobate when we see one. And a reprobate, the word in the original, means someone who is void of moral judgment. Void of moral judgment. And you can be a gutter reprobate. Now I want to bring this out too because there are people, some who are very religious who are reprobates. They have an air of religiosity to them. They may have an air of sophistication. They may have a lot of letters behind their name, a lot of degrees. But if they have rejected Christ and they have flat out rejected God's standards, then God's morals absolutely mean nothing to them. Yet they will say they are championing some even Christian values when they're not Christian values at all. If you want to know what Christian values are, you get them from here not a lexicon or somewhere else. You don't get them from a papal bull. You don't get them from that. You don't get that from a pop psychology and religious classes. And you certainly don't get it from the culture. The culture is nothing more than a reflection of the values of the individuals practicing whatever corruption the culture, the culture is accepting. And the politicians, they will go with what the culture is saying because that's where the votes come from. That's why there's such a push for such of the perversions that you're seeing today is because they're appealing to a culture that is okay with throwing that into the face of God. That's how corrupt our country has become. Universities are proponents of that. Teachers unions are proponents of that. They are trying to cancel Jesus Christ. He is the target of their hostility. They may say they have nothing against him, but if you read Psalm chapter 2, verses 1 through 2, you see there that the people have decoupled their conscience from God, and as a result, they have tried to loosen culpability for their moral failures. And in doing so, that callousness has created a hardness, and that hardness has got to have a target to hurt. They've got to hurt. That's because they have become, they have allowed themselves by their own volition to be adopted by Satan. That's what they've done. We are adopted children of God through faith in Christ. We are the adoptees of God through faith in Christ Jesus. They are the adoptees of Satan through their moral relevancy. And that's the world we live in. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. The Republican Party, nor the Democrat Party, or the Libertarian Party are the light of the world. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And when you get rid of Jesus Christ, you have canceled God. And Jesus, speaking of the name of Jesus, he's either been drugged through the mud or perverted or denounced. You know that. I remember when I was asked several times, 
I get a letter, still do, every year from Roanoke City looking for area ministers to be there for their annual prayer breakfast or their monthly meeting. And they'll put you on the docket as the minister to open up the meeting with a prayer. But you cannot pray in the name of Jesus Christ. You're supposedly not, or you won't get asked back. When you go to do a commencement, it used to be that you couldn't pray. Now, there are those who have stood against that. But why would that be right, that you could... You can't pray in the name of Jesus Christ, but you can have a drag show. These freaks terrorizing children. That's because they're reprobates. Only a reprobate acts that way. And when you're given an opportunity, sometimes in a workplace fun time, the military does this at times. They'll get the men to dress up and put on a fancy show in front of the others just for fun. They're making fun of women. Number one, they're making fun of women. Where's the outcry of that? But in the Old Testament, it was a capital offense for a man to act like that. It was an offense for a man to wear a woman's clothing, period, and vice versa. They looked a lot alike, but their materials were totally different. And when you saw a woman coming, you knew it was a woman. And when you saw a man coming, you knew it was a man. God wanted that distinction to stay there. And he'll get the last word. What did the chief priests and the Pharisees think of this light of life? This light of eternal life. They wanted to cancel it. They thought they were the light. They thought their religion was the light. Jesus Christ had performed so many undeniable miracles and so many Jewish people had witnessed them that they could not look away. They could not help but know Jesus was not from this world. But hardened in unbelief and drunk with the desire to hold on to power, they denied the Lord and Messiah Jesus Christ. They said in John chapter 11, if you want to turn there, you know where I'm going with this. They said in John chapter 11 and verse 48, after they'd seen all the miracles that Jesus had done, verse 45, it says after a lot of these miracles, and like, especially like Lazarus come forth of verse 43 of John chapter 11, spoken with a loud voice, Lazarus, get out here. And he that was dead came forth, verse 44 of chapter 11, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound with a washcloth with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. That many of the Jews who came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their way to the Pharisees. <laughs> when you see something wonderful happen, why do you go to see a skeptic? That's what they did, because they too were skeptical. They want to try to get points with the Pharisees. Oh, my <clears throat> word. When you die, you're not going to fall down and hope that you've got good points with the Pharisee type. That's why I don't have any tolerance for legalists. I don't answer to those suckers. When they try to press me into a corner in a meeting to comply or to be like they are why you don't do the aisle running and the hand raising or now the flagging down to 747 your eyes roll back in your head like you didn't go up into the cray cray world like you're on some kind of dope you're in this big auditorium which black as hell looks like a nightclub somewhere with blue lights and some hippie looking band up there singing some Jesus swag And in many cases, half-dressed, doing vocal gymnastics to try to impress people. Because it's not a worship service. It's a praise me service. It's not a praise him service. And you don't want to kind of go along with that to get along with that. You know, you're starting to look like you're out of the loop. Well, they can have it. These Pharisees said, after they gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees' council and said, what do we do? <laughs> what are we going to do? What a dumb question. What a dumb question. Here is someone who has the power to raise the dead, heal all these. No one had ever done this kind of stuff before.
And they're still, they still have that same question today. Now, a lot of them have said, we know what we're going to do. We're going to turn away from the Lord entirely. But anyway, what do we? For this man doeth many miracles. So they didn't deny that he had did, the, did the miracles. They couldn't deny it. It was right in front of them. If we let him thus alone, all will believe on him. That's terrible, you know? Going to heaven for all paradise, having all your sorrows taken away, all your tears wiped away, all your grief gone, being in the presence of the Lord. Enjoying the blessings of eternity forever. That's terrible. You don't want that, do you? If we thus let him alone, all the men will believe on him, and the Romans will come and take away both our place and nation. What it says right there, and in John 12, 42, he said, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees they did not confess him lest they should be put out of the synagogue, canceled by their own people. They said if we let him alone, all will believe on him and the Romans will come and take our place in our nation. Newsflash, our nation, you are under Roman occupation. As far as Caesar was concerned, that belonged to him. He just let the governors do there, so stay there so that he can have some sort of moderation of control of the people. As long as you're just not too many ripples in the pond, we'll let you go what you want to do. We'll let you govern your own people. But just remember, we can come just like they did with Titus in 70 AD and wipe y'all out in a moment's notice. They were currently under Roman occupation, and before that, Alexander the Greeks' occupation, and before that, Persian captivity, and before that, Babylonian captivity. What do you mean you're going to take away your nation? It was already gone. <laughs> they were in denial of their sad state of affairs, especially their spiritual condition before God. They were blind. Jesus Christ couldn't make them to see who he was. Now, I want you and I to think about this when we get exasperated talking to people. Even God can't get people to believe in him. Even Jesus can raise the dead and people didn't believe in him because people are going to believe what they want to believe. I don't care how much you adore them, how much you love them, how kin you are to them. That's got nothing to do with free volition. People are going to believe and they're going to do whatever it is they want to do. <clears throat> Their day of reckoning, just as ours, will come. The world is trying to cancel Jesus Christ. And where I'm getting to with this is that I see all of this machinery that churches are employing today trying to fight against something that they have no power over, and that is the free will of mankind. They don't seem to get that the free will of mankind is the reason why churches are empty. Idiots are running their, their governments. Crazy people are doing weird things, and it's acceptable in their circle of friends and family sometimes. You can't make people see what they have right in front of them. It doesn't, and we are to have a good testimony for the Lord's sake. <coughs> I like what it says in Romans chapter 2 in that vein of thought here. These are extemporaneous thoughts, obviously. Romans 2, 3, it says, Thinkest thou this, O man, people of the dirt, that judges them who do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God. Talking to the Jews, thought they were better than the Gentiles. Or despises thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that it is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. But after thy continual hardness, your volitional hardness, verse 5, Romans 2, but after thy hardness and <clears throat> impenitent or unrepentant hearts, you are storing up unto yourself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of the righteous judgment of God who will render every man according to his deeds. People, they're just coals of fire being put on these folks' head. It doesn't have to be that way, but 
You are not here for you. You're here for God to justify himself through you to the world. You're here for God to justify himself through you to the world. We're not going to be the final say on what some people say, think, or do. Our testimony, not only the gospel testimony, but the testimony of our faith, doing the right thing, is here to bring judgment on the free volition of the lost who won't receive. Now, there are those who get saved, praise the Lord, and they get on board and they get to, hopefully, they'll get into a doctrinal church where they'll learn to understand these <coughs> things. And they won't be caught up in the three-ring circus that so many churches have turned to. But you're here for God's purpose, and that is that he's justified, and he will prove that he's justified in condemning the lost. If we must remember, there will be a lot more people in hell than there will be in heaven. And the, the, most of the world doesn't feel that way about it. But Jesus Christ couldn't make people who, in his day to believe who he was. You cannot make people believe what they do not want to see. Don't feel bad if you too cannot convince your friends and your family to believe in Christ. Jesus couldn't. Only his family accepted him and believed in him after his bodily resurrection. Now, I don't know about, about, so much about Mary. But she, all, she also wanted that intervention done earlier when he said who he said he was. And he had already told her, I, I, when he was 12 years old, i got to be about my pappy's work, my father's work. But don't feel bad if you too cannot convince your friends and family to believe in Jesus Christ. I don't care how good you try to be with them, how patient, and continue. I'm not saying don't be patient or kind and gentle. We're commanded to be that way. But we're not the judge. They don't answer to us. They're not accountable to us. And we, but we are accountable to them to be a good Christian testimony. People are going to believe what they want, regardless of the overwhelming evidence that God provides. They're going to believe what they want. And so in Romans 1, 19 through 20, teaches us that our conscience and our self-awareness or self-consciousness knows full well that there is a God. And this is before we got saved. And there's a God who made the world for us to turn to for our salvation. And it's a beautiful thing to look at. I remember as a little boy laying out under the old maple tree in our backyard, looking up at the clouds in the sky, and just wondering about things and contemplating eternity as a 12-year-old or whatever, whatever I was. But I was a young boy. Didn't have a care in the world at the time. And I was just wondering about things, you know. And, and that's just when I started wondering about, you know, what about me? You know, is there something more to this life? You don't really say those things out loud. <laughs> you know, they may haul you off. But you're thinking those things, and they're just subtly coming to you. And when God first starts speaking to your conscience and your self-consciousness, your self-awareness, when you're speaking, God's speaking through your conscience. He puts some, enough in you to pin you, and he's trying to echo it all for your self-awareness. Wake up, John. Wake up, John. Wake up, Wally. You know, wake up, so-and-so. That's what he's saying to us. Hear me, hear me, hear me. He's waiting on us a response to say, I want to know more. I want to know more. Psalm 19, 1 through 3. You want to jot that one down, maybe, in this context. It says, the heavens declare the glory of God. They manifest the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day into day utter speech, and night into night shows knowledge. There is no speech. There is no, no language where their voice is not seen. That is comprehended. People all over the world can comprehend that there is a God just by looking into the starry heavens. That's when God is speaking to them. He's too big to whisper in their ear. Remember, Jesus not only whispered in people's ears, he shouted to them and they didn't believe. But those who do want to believe will believe. 
And as the old saying goes, darn the, the torpedoes, as they say, whatever come will come. But it says, night unto night shows knowledge. Day unto day utters speech. You see the creation. Night unto night shows knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice, that is the testimony of God's creation seen in the heavens, there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Nowhere. No dialect. There's over 6,000 dialects in the world. And every one of them knows that there's a God. I don't care if you're raised in Afghanistan or if you're raised in the Sistine Chapel. I don't care if you're raised here in the, in the Bible Belt of the South or if you're raised in some other place. It doesn't make any difference. And what I wanted to add to that is my little, uh, I hit bold here. You cannot silence God with science. He screams through science. The more you study real science, the more God screams out to us. The more he's evident to us. Science actually declares that there is an omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent, all-present God. Because it doesn't matter if you're at the North Pole, the South Pole, anywhere around the equator, anywhere in the world. People have thoughts about God wherever they are. When they look into the starry heavens, when they look at creation, that's the first step. That's the first beginning of establishing a relationship with God. And of course, the gospel comes later. Mike and I talked about some other things regarding those who do not have the gospel, perhaps in their place. Remember Hebrews chapter 1, that's, what I, that's one of my fallbacks when I get that kind of a question, is that God has been known to speak. Look how he spoke to Jacob and the angels ascending and descending. And he had a wrestling match. He walked with his hip out of joint the rest of his life. He spoke to him. He spoke through angels. He spoke through visions. He spoke through dreams to these people. And it says there in Hebrews, here in these last days, he's spoken to us through his son. That was Jesus, as you know. But Paul, the apostle, told Titus regarding the pastors. Now I want you to turn to Titus now. A little shifting here, a little shifty shifting here. Titus chapter 1. So as my brother-in-law in Tennessee says, Titus chapter 1. Titus chapter 1. We have a responsibility to stand up for the truth, to speak such things as I'm saying tonight, and other things, obviously, to speak the truth as well as we know it. You say, well, I'm not really eloquent. God does not look for eloquence. I'm not really cool. He's not looking for cool. That's the last thing he's looking for. That's a narcissist right there if a person thinks they're not cool enough to be relevant. That's a very immature person. <laughs> he just wants you to be faithful. Paul, Paul told the apostle, uh, Paul the apostle told Titus regarding looking out for men to put into the ministry there on the, on Crete. He says, "I left you." Verse five. I left you in Crete that thou shouldest set in order, now this part of this study that I may get into is the difference, as you know, between the organized church and the organic church. The organic church is the universal church. It, you are an organism. You are a part of the body of Christ. You are living stones. You are a part of Christ. That's an organism. You're in the body of Christ. That's organic, spiritual organics okay but you also he designed that there should be an organization for those organics to function as a team as a group for this cause i left thee in crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are lacking or wanting let's see we need to get the blue lights ordered go to amazon and get those done uh, we'll get so-and-so to order the fog machines uh and then we'll get somebody. No, those weren't the things that were wanting or lacking. First thing I want you to do is I want you to appoint. The word ordain there means to appoint. I want you to appoint 
elders in every city as I had appointed thee. That's accusative masculine plural there. That's You would have an elder for each church. Elders in every city. That's accusative masculine plural. All pastors are male only. Ordain, now I didn't mean that there's not wonderful women teachers. Kay Arthur is a wonderful woman teacher. I've got some of her books. But she didn't try to be a pastor either. Ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee, because he was also an elder. If any of these elders be a memptos, blameless. In other words, you didn't say sinless, but you've got a good testimony. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife. That doesn't mean one at a time. That's the genitive of description is used in the original there. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife. Having faithful children, not accused of profligacy or unruliness. Rowdy. For a bishop, which is another aspect of the pastor's responsibility, must be blameless as the steward of God. We're going to see why in just a moment. Why why is this joker got to have all these qualifications? Just flesh, sinner like everybody else. A bishop must be blameless as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, not violent, not given to a filthy lucre or ill-gotten gain, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober-minded, just, holy, temperate, knows how to control his passions, holding fast the faithful word, that's doctrine, holding fast to the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may, by that faithful word, be able by sound teaching or sound doctrine both to exhort but also to convince the gainsayers or the confute the opposers. There's plenty of them. For there are many unruly, that means undisciplined and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision, whose mouths must be stopped. Who is the last person that is going to be responsible to make sure that those who teach false teaching aren't, are called out? The pastor is. He's supposed to do it. He is not to be just the nice guy on the block. The pencil neck pansy. That's not what he's to be. He's supposed to be, he doesn't have to be physically big. But he has to have the backbone and the sanity of mind and the doctrinal training to be able to stop the mouths. And the word stop means to muzzle like a dog. That's what the original Greek means. You can muzzle them like a dog. As Pastor Frampton used to say, uh, be able to not only shut their water off, but take their pump out too, because they're spreading an infection that is destroying the church. They're spreading, as it were, a dope or a drug that is destroying the church. There is a dope that it, and a drug that is destroying the local church. And this series is about saving the local church. And there are things that are popular in churches today that are like dope that are destroying the church. And that's why I cannot be a part of it. And there are the others who cannot be a part of it. And for false teaching that goes along as well, it has to be called out too. And the pastor's job is not to be the nice guy on the block. He doesn't need to be a jerk, obviously, because you'll, you know, it, but he, if people sometimes will get rid of a preacher because he's doing his job and they don't know what it is, or they won't accept what his job is. The pastor has to be able to not just be somebody that presents the work, but he is the number one guy. He's the point of the spear when it comes to defending the, the, the mission of the local church. And so you've got to have a stable life and you've got to be a disciplined person. Your children may not like the fact that you were a disciplined parent. But that's what you're called to be. And they can either say, I don't like it, or they can rebel. That's up to them. That will be between them and the Lord. That doesn't disqualify the pastor if his children don't want to follow the faith that he taught them 
all those years. Or his church. There are a lot of unruly, vain talkers and deceivers out there. And when I became a pastor, even though I was only 23 years old and I didn't get a church until I was 47, I was a little slow. <laughs> <clears throat> There's an awful lot that you've had to learn, and some of it the hard way, but you finally realize I know whose team I'm on. I don't have an identity crisis. I'm not trying to play footsies with the world and get along with the country club group. I don't care whether the university or the seminary still thinks that I am a person that they want to have their name hanging on my office wall. <laughs> they got my money, so that's good. But he says these pastors have to be those who know sound doctrine, who when the false teachers come around, they know their stuff so they can prevent an infection of apostasy, which brings with it divine discipline on that local church. It's like when you know that there is a disease that your cattle can get, you inoculate them against it. We used to have to give the black leg uh, inoculation every year. We had a couple of inoculations that we gave our cattle every year because that'll ruin your herd. There are things that can destroy your herd. There are things that can destroy chickens. Uh, we had a cholera outbreak one year and we had to kill all of our hens and we had this big, big pit that we had to dig out and we had to kill all, we killed several hundred chickens and then we buried them. We burn them, put stuff on, burn them, and then we buried, we buried them because they couldn't, you couldn't eat the eggs, you couldn't eat the, the meat. You had to, so, you know, you can put the inoculation in in different forms, you know, li obviously mostly liquid was the one that most would use now with the droppers and everything. When they're young, you can inoculate a lot of them. But there are a lot of unruly and vain talkers and deceivers whose mouths must be stopped who subvert whole houses teaching things which they ought not for ill-gotten gain. So you, you're not any better than anybody else, but you're psychologically suited for it. There are people who are not psychologically suited to be ministers. They're not suited for it. They are self-acclaimed. They are self-appointed. That's why better than half of those who get called into ministry within seven years or better than half of those who go into the ministry within seven years quit. They completely give up. And of those, better than half of those never reach it to the retirement year. They never retire as a minister. They go on to something else because... Uh, for whatever reason. And maybe it's best to do that at times. But it's a different calling. We don't think about the apostles because we don't have that gift anymore. They have authority over all the churches. I don't have any authority over any churches. We used to have a fellow in the neighborhood who acted like he was the neighborhood apostle. And he would visit churches. And then he would rag on that pastor when he got to the next pastor's church. Then he'd find something wrong with them, and of course the church before. Then he'd go to the next church, and then he would rag on them and them, and he just he was the county rag, always ragging on the the faults of that church. Well, that man's not called; he's not a Calvinist. That man's not called; he doesn't hold to uh, uh, these creeds uh, that he was really big on, and this, that, and the other, and everything. Trying to play the county apostle. There are no apostles. These guys aren't walking around raising the dead, <laughs> healing the sick, showing their credentials. They're showing their credentials of being something else, too, and there's one of those little th uh, animals that the Balaam had. That's what they were, and that's as far as I go with that one. But one of their own selves, verse 12, even a prophet of their own said, the Cretans are always liars and evil, and evil beast and slow bellies. The word there in the Greek is gastrous argi. <laughs> so we can kind of get a feel like that. We would also use the term blowhard or gluttons. 
because you can't pronounce your T's today and be culturally right, you know. This testimony is true, wherefore rebuke, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, rebuke them sharply. He didn't say play nice with them. He said rebuke these guys sharply. What purpose? Now, he's talking about another believer. That they may be sound in taste to us, the faith, the word of God. Present active subjunctive, that they may be sound, rebuke them sharply, and that's in the imperative mood, which is a command. Present active imperative, present active imp, as I have in my notes here. Rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith. That's a command from the Lord to the Apostle Paul to every pastor, not just somebody that nobody likes. Rebuke them sharply. This is not church wide, this is individual stuff, okay? Not giving heed to Jew and, he, and he was, in this case it was for those who were giving heed to Jewish fables. And these were the oral traditions of the Talmud. They were giving heed to that, and he said, "No, you leave that stuff alone. That's in the past, and that's not what doctrine was back then. Even the Torah and the Talmud, not the same thing. It's not the commentaries or the commentaries and everything else, or the Mishnah, whatever else that came along. But you're supposed to be sound in the Bible." And these guys were giving heed to these, what he called, fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. P unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is nothing pure, but even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work, reprobate. Rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, verse 13. So if they were unbelievers, then the first that they need to be sound in the salvation message. So anyway, there's there are a lot of needs there. And he says here that they subvert houses. On a trepo is the word there. And it means they overthrow churches. They overthrow homes. They twist the truth to their own narrative to suit their wants. You've got to... Get tough with people who insist on casting shade on the truth. You got to get tough with people who insist on casting shade on the truth. That is, putting it down. They are not sound in the faith. They profess to know God, but in works they deny Him. A few more points and we'll close up. The war on the followers of Jesus Christ is then nothing new as people deny what is all around them, as it is in Jesus' day they did it. As we said in our closing last time, when you consciously cancel Jesus Christ, you have consciously canceled God. Psalm 2, 1 through 2 tells us corrupt leaders do this and their po political puppets follow to cancel God and his son Jesus Christ, the anointed. Then these corrupt men write and then declare laws that their people in mass must also follow in their darkness. That people and their nations and their states should also follow in their disobedience to God. That we that we should follow their unbelief. That the mass of people in that nation also, as well as their leaders, decouple from God and especially his son Jesus Christ. And that's what our leaders are asking us to do. Decouple from God. Decouple from your morals. Decouple from the idea of ever having a heaven and just becoming a part of the bone orchard when you die. Just forget all about the promises of God. And who in the world is that? That is Satan telling that. No man comes to the Father, Jesus says, but by me. People do not need to look all around themselves to see if God exists. They simply need to examine their hearts and ask themselves, why don't I believe God exists? Who am I following? Am I following the light? Or am I following the darkness? And if you think you're following the light, but you're not following the Bible, where is that light going to lead you? It's certainly not going to be heaven. Psalm 14, 1 says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none of these that do good. And so when people reject the light and who Jesus Christ is, the Bible says they are fools. 
You know, there are a lot of people who don't like the minister to talk like that. That's why they keep trying to have a version of the Bible that has nothing that would hurt anybody's feelings. Well, then you don't have a Bible. Because I'm going to tell you what, people's feelings are going to get hurt when they get cast into the lake of fire. That is part of the, of the Easter story. I'll be bringing down some of that out Sunday. Why would you want to preach on something like that on Easter? It's all supposed to be about eggs and fuzzy ears. Well, I've got the fuzzy ears. I'll have to admit that. I have to shave them every once in a while. My wife says, what is that coming out of there? When we were little, our mama, my mama would say, you got to clean behind your ears. You can plant potatoes back there. <laughs> yes, mama. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that does good. Now you think about what you're seeing every night on your TV screen if you've got the gut, the, the, the heart to look at it. Abominations, corruption, they're fools. In their heart, they're saying there is no God. And they want you to follow them. David Limbaugh stated in his book, Persecution, how liberals are waging war against Christians, this is the book I was telling you about right here. Here's a little picture of it. Okay. I'll leave it up here. Somebody wants to look at it sometime. But he talks about how liberals are waging war against Christians. That the trouble with too many Christians is that they do not want to be associated with radical Bible-believing, salvation-witnessing, Christ-following Christians. I'm going to say that again. Too many people who call themselves Christians in America, they do not want to be associated with us. We're radicals to them. We're too emotional. We get too excited. We get too specific about certain things that are in their Bible too. I don't know what Bible they're reading from. These devotees to Jesus Christ make it hard, that is, the devotees to Christ, that is, the positive believers. He says, Limbaugh continues to say, they make it hard for the liberal believers to identify comfortably with their friends, their employees, and society in general. You're making it hard for me to enjoy my friends because you're saying that I should be doing this and the Bible says I should be doing that. I don't want to go to church that teaches too much Bible because I like room to wiggle. I like to see it do that once in a while. This fellow's book right here says in page 108, <laughs> <laughs> regarding what also he said, Curiously, even many mainstream Christians of the main line who tend to be rather more liberal in, the, in a number of areas exhibit a strong emotional reaction when the subject of the Christian right comes up. They seem to abhor being held accountable regarding their own Christian values, at least from those people. Coming from those people, that is, positive Christians. Coming from those people, after all, is a point of view about Christian belief which liberals know longer share although of course they once did they no longer share the same values and there are a lot of Christians that do not share your values they may be saved but they do not share your values and there are a lot of Christians who are just apostates you couldn't have apostates which are negative believers unless they were negative believers and you wouldn't have a remnant which is a small group that will be left, though we both, the apostate and the remnant, will get caught up in the rapture. <coughs> There'll be a different story at the Bema seat. But often it is the liberal believer that makes it hard for a conservative believer because we don't have very many people standing beside of us. We're not very popular. And see, in society, people think that you're popular if you've got a large following or if you've got a large group. You wonder why there's not a lot of people that are just flocking. People have been listening to people from this church, former pastor for 34 years, me for 19 almost, and they know me. They've heard me. I've spoken at other places. Our website is on our sign. It says six feet, well, four feet across. 
people look, that's how most people know who we are. Some will even hear this message. And they'll say to themselves, I'll never go there. Look, when you've gotten saved, you get passion. And when you're going to heaven, you rejoice over it. But when you see air, it's like somebody walking into your yard trying to sell dope to your children. And when you see false teaching, it's like somebody is trying to sell dope to the church. In the not-too-distant future, the demand of the Antichrist is going to be supercharged. And it's going to supercharge the wickedness that's in the world today. And his desire to hurt those who do get saved in the tribulation period is going to be very intense. It is said of the Antichrist as being the Poneros, evil one, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. I think of people on the Supreme Court, I think of even presidents and senators, who actually think that they are almighty God. And they are fools. The Christian who is not fully devoted to Jesus Christ <coughs> continues to sit on the fence of compromise between divine righteousness and human good. Too many professed Christians accept things in society and even things wrong in their own life to be okay. Even when God still calls those things evil. They accept things in the name of human good all for the sake of unity and the brotherhood of man. That is a misnomer. The brother, there is no such thing as the brotherhood of man. That's a false doctrine. That's a liberal doctrine. That is not a biblical teaching. That falls into the category of universalism that everyone makes it finally some way or another. That God gives everybody a trophy in the end. <laughs> They are a pawn in canceling Jesus Christ's influence. And I want, through my testimony of my life, not to be a pawn who is being used by society because I'm a coward. And I, through my cowardice, are, is canceling the influence of Jesus Christ in our society. They are a pawn in canceling, canceling the message of redemption that you can actually work your way there, that you can be a nice person and you can get there. That's not true. Or you can believe some other belief system. I've heard so many people say, and it makes me sick to hear it, it doesn't matter as long as you got faith. Well, that's the dumbest thing. I can have faith in that jug right there, but I'm not going to get to heaven. The object of our faith is what counts. It's not, not a promo a day right here. I just want to put that out there. But they are a pawn in canceling Jesus Christ's influence and message of redemption within their own family and their own circle of friends. If you just tone it down with your convictions, we might get along a little bit better. Well, you're the one that's out of line, not me. You are. If you're lost or if you are saved and you're following the things that are an abomination, they're the one that needs to get right. Not you. You just keep a soft tone about it, and that's the best you can do. And that's where the doctrine of biblical separation comes in. There has to be sometimes separation for there to be sanctification. Or, would I say, maintaining your, your sanity. Vacation. It's a new word. I didn't coin that one, but... They are a pawn. We don't want to be a pawn in canceling Jesus Christ. Influence and, and, or, or his message of redemption. But they don't want to do that. They, they don't realize that uh, they're actually encouraging their family and friends to not know the truth. All in the hope of having a greater society as a result. Human good is mankind's substitute for the righteousness of God. As Pastor Adrian Rogers once said, Better to be divided by doctrine than united by heresy. And that was, I always liked the way he said that. His baritone voice, you know, was always so nice. But it was true. Better to be divided by doctrine or truth than to be united with a falsehood or with heresy. That you can get to heaven uh, 
by just being this, that, or the other, that there's, you know, no such thing as this, that, or the other, you know, that we're supposed to all get along. Everybody's going to be all right. No, they're not. Most people are going to the lake of fire. Just putting that out there, it's free of charge. And I don't, I find no joy in that, but the truth of the matter is the audacity of many ministers to be proponents of a universalism when it comes to salvation is just right out of hell. It's right from the devil. Because these poor souls, a lot of them don't know any better. And those deceivers, well, they've been deceived and they're selling what they got. It's a sad thing, very sad thing. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. We thank you for truth. We thank you that you make things clear that it, they don't have to be hard for us, that they're only hard if we're still wrestling with them. They're very easy. Father, we thank you that you make it easy to be convicted when we're not sitting on a fence. You make it easy for us to talk to others about Christ in a nice way, a gentle way, a caring way, and that they understand the truth and that we don't have to change the truth to suit the people. The church doesn't have to change its tactics because we know that the Holy Spirit is the one who does the saving of the soul. We realize, Father, that if people don't want your word, they don't want anything else. If they just want music and entertainment, that they don't want Christ. Father, help us to understand things that we're here to reach the spirit of the person or the soul of the person. And that you are the one that we find our love in, we find our rejoicing in, we find our peace in. Thank you for the understanding that you give us and the knowledge that you give us. Help us to be a witness. Help us to not, as Paul said, not to be ashamed of the gospel, but to put it out there. Not to be ashamed of the doctrines and the teachings of the Bible, but to put it out there. Help us to understand these things in their dispensation. Help us to understand these things in their purpose, Father, for our own lives particularly as we walk with you in Christ. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen.